Hi everyone and welcome to Exploring the Build. If you've just found this place, then welcome. And if you're returning, I'm glad to have you back. I'm Alex and this is my channel where we explore and theorycraft different character builds, usually for Dungeons and Dragons. But today, we are back to Daggerheart. Daggerheart recently had its 1.4 update, where they took and tweaked some rules from the 1.3 version. The difference between 1.3 to 1.4 isn't as large as it was from 1.2 to 1.3, but there will still be some significant changes that we're going to talk about in the video. We'll be theory crafting and character build around a specific part of the rule set to sort of highlight not only what we can do in the Daggerheart system, but to show off how the rule systems work as a whole and really stress test it to really see just what we can do in the Daggerheart system. The concept for today's video is our stress serif. We're building a character who is meant to be able to use stress as well as clear stress in order to get the most out of all of their abilities. Stress is a mechanic we've touched on in our other builds, but we haven't fully looked at it specifically, and so it is now time to do that. In addition to stress, we're also going to be looking at leveling up a character and how that works in Daggerheart, and we'll be taking this character up to level 3 just so we can get a feel for not only how the leveling up system works, but also how a character build could narrow and how a power level could increase as we get into higher levels. Okay, so we are back on Demiplane to look at our Stress Seraph today. And like I mentioned, Daggerheart 1.4 did get released and updated from 1.3, and I was able to playtest it with the same group that I had playtested 1.2 with. So when looking at the Stress Seraph, even though we're mainly going to be looking at how the stress mechanic and level up system works in Daggerheart, I also will be drawing on that playtest experience, even though we didn't record it, just to talk about how things have changed and how they felt in 1.4 compared to 1.3 and 1.2. We've got a lot to get through, so let's jump into this character build. Starting with our class, I picked Seraph because I find that they have access to the most mechanics that interact with the stress feature, especially once they start leveling up, and we'll see that once we get there. So we're of course going to select Seraph as our class, and then looking at our subclass, we can see immediately that both of these subclasses do have offensive capabilities. The Wing Sentinel just gives us the ability to fly, and we can spend a hope to carry another creature with us whenever we do fly, and we can also mark a stress to deal an additional d8 damage whenever we make a successful attack. It's a little smite-like feature. The subclass we're going to go with today, though, is Divine Wielder. Divine Wielder has two abilities, one that is Spirit Weapon. When we have a melee weapon equipped, it can fly to our hand to strike an enemy in close range, so we have a little bit of skirmish versatility. And then we can also mark a stress to target an additional target in range of that attack with the same attack roll, so we even have a little bit of a cleave, too. We also get Sparing Touch, which says that once per long rest, we can use an action, touch a creature, to clear two hit points or two stress from them. I like Divine Wielder over Winged Sentinel purely for this build, because it has an ability that uses stress, and it has an ability that can clear stress right away from the subclass. We'll then quickly look at our traits. I am actually not going to take the suggested traits this time. I personally would like to put a plus one into agility and then keep our strength as plus two. Strength is the Seraph's primary ability score, so that makes sense. And agility, as I talked about in the Thorns Guardian video, is actually very important for mobility. So we do want to keep that relatively high. The other two traits, though, can be anything. So we'll just quickly assign instinct as our plus one and maybe finesse as our minus one. Now that we have our subclass and our traits set up, we're going to skip over our weapons and armor because I want to talk about them a little bit more in depth since there was a change from 1.3 into 1.4 with them, but we will go down to our domain deck cards and pick our first two domain cards. Now the Seraph has access to the Valor and Splendor domains. The Guardian also had access to the Valor domain, and our Thorns Guardian really liked the Bare Bones card. The Bare Bones card inadvertently kind of got nerfed. Before it was almost an auto pick because of how efficient it was, but now not so much. We'll talk about that a little more later. Instead, what we are going to pick is the I Am Your Shield card. We talked about this during our Thorns Guardian as well, as it's an ability that actually lets us tank hits for our party members who are within very close range of us. We mark a stress, we take the hit instead of them, and we can automatically reduce the damage that we take by a value equal to our strength trait, and then we can also spend armor slots as well if we want to. It's a really good tanking card and would have been good with this with the Thorns Guardian if it wasn't for the fact that we would have been spending so much stress when we did that. Here though, for our Stress Seraph, it's a perfect pick. 
The other card we're going to pick is going to be from the Spunder Domain. Although I will mention that Forceful Push, the last Valor Domain card, is another offensive type ability, which could be pretty good if you wanted. Bolt Beacon is an offensive Splendor ability, which is kind of like the Guiding Bolt spell in D&D 5e. And it could be an interesting option, but we're not going to take that one this time. Instead, we're just going to take Mending Touch. Mending Touch allows us to take a few minutes to focus on a person we're helping, and then spend two hope to either heal a hit point or a stress from that person. However, once per long rest, when we spend this healing time actually learning something new about them or revealing something about ourselves, that two hope instead heals two hit points or two stress instead. This is an interesting ability because it adds in more narrative depth mechanically to the action that you're doing, which is what Daggerheart presents itself as wanting to try and do. However, if you were to look at it from a pure mechanic standpoint, it's actually really odd because the two hope to heal one hit point or one stress is kind of really below the cost curve for hope to hit points or hope to stress. To sort of quickly summarize what I mean by that, when we talked about the Thorns Guardian, we had sort of touched on this cost curve or ratio for evasion to armor, and that kind of exists in Daggerheart for hope and other resources as well. Whenever you spend a hope, you're getting some benefit from it. And in our case, if we're looking at spending hope to heal hit points or clear stress, which is like stamina, then really we want to try to be as efficient as possible. So we can see just based off this ability alone, spending two hope to get one hit point or one stress isn't going to be as good as this once per long rest ability to gain two hit points back or two stress instead. Especially since we know that Divine Wielder has Sparing Touch, which lets us clear two hit points or two stress without spending a hope. And it's still a once per long rest ability. We'll take Mending Touch for now, just because it's an extra way to clear stress. But given the concept that there is this sort of efficiency curve or ratio to spending hope in order to heal, clear stress, or do other effects. This means that as we level up, we may eventually want to switch it out for a different card to have in our kit, because it's just not going to be as useful all the time. Now it's time to look at our weapons and armor. Our weapons, I'm just going to go ahead and quickly say exactly what we want. We're going to want to take the Hallowed Axe that is suggested by the game to pick up, because it's a one-handed weapon, and we're going to want a shield on this build. It deals a d10 plus one magic damage, which so far in the couple playtests I've done, magic damage has been the better of the two damage types. There's magic and there's physical. And physical has been the only one that's really been resisted. We haven't ran into anything that is resistant to magic damage yet. So just based on those limited experiences, I'd say that the magic damage is what we want with the Hallowed Axe. The other thing we're going to want, though, is a shield. Now, both the round shield and the tower shield did get nerfed from 1.3 into 1.4. Basically, the round shield used to add plus two to your armor score with no penalty, which was really, really good, very efficient, and just almost an auto pick, especially when compared to the tower shield. Now it only adds plus one to our armor score, so it's a little less, but there's still no penalty to evasion or anything like that. So it's still a great idea to pick this, which is what we're gonna do. The tower shield though, has actually just gotten flat out nerfed even more. Before, the tower shield was still on par for its own sort of efficiency, it's just that the round shield was way better. Now, tower shield adds 3 to our armor score, but it gives us a hefty minus 2 to our evasion. 3 armor score for 2 evasion just isn't really what we're looking for, and I don't know if it would ever really be a good pick. I could be wrong, of course. A lot of people might like tower shields just in general, and they might be willing to bite the minus 2 evasion if they want, but that's really up to them. For us, the round shield, even though it's only giving one armor score, is just going to be what we want since it doesn't have any sort of penalty associated with it. Looking at the armor now, we can see how the cost curve was changed in 1.4. Right away, all the armor scores have been redone, and they also removed breastplate armor and added in gambeson armor. We can see that leather armor at the bottom is the base armor. It provides four armor score, no bonuses, no penalties. If we take Gambison armor. We lose two armor score, but we gain a plus one to evasion. So that cost curve of one evasion equals two armor score is back on track. And we know that's true because we can also look at chainmail. And our chainmail has an armor score of six, but it is heavy, so it has a minus one to evasion. So the same cost of one evasion equals two armor score. 
full plate, has a minus two to evasion and a minus one to agility, but it has an eight armor score. So it's still on par with that cost curve, but just has that added little penalty of agility because it is the heaviest armor. We're gonna bite the bullet and take the full plate armor anyways, just because we want really heavy armor with a nice armor score, because we're gonna be trying to reduce damage as much as possible. The other thing I will mention is that the domain card bare bones, because it didn't get revamped to fit in with this armor score cost curve, it still gives you a flat armor score of three plus your level if you're not wearing armor. That means that it is the exact same thing as wearing leather armor, it will just scale a little bit better because it scales with your level, whereas you'd have to actually find better armor in game to get something that scales that way. So it's kind of a soft nerf. It's not the end of the world, but it's definitely not something that we want to look into for this build. So now that we've got our weapons and armor, we've done our class portion of the selection, and it's time to look at our heritage, which is something I skipped in the Thorns Guardian. This time, there's actually been a big change to ancestries, so we're definitely gonna look at that, but I'm quickly gonna look at what community we want. The communities have all been kept more or less the same from 1.3 to 1.4. There have been a couple changes that have felt pretty significant. One of which is Ridgeborn, which is the community that we're choosing for this build. Ridgeborn is back to being one of my favorite communities, at least on paper, because not only does it give us advantage on rolls to traverse dangerous cliffs, ledges, harsh environments, and using our survival knowledge, which feels like a really good ranger tip ability, but it also just gives us an extra armor slot at character creation, which is perfect for the build that we're going for here, and would potentially have even been perfect for our Thorns Guardian build. But that was back in 1.3 where it didn't do this. Now for our ancestry, right away I want to say that we would usually want to pick Furbolg for a stress type build. The reason is because Furbolgs have natural calm. Whenever they would mark a stress, they roll a d6, and on a roll of 6, they don't mark that stress. That's really great for getting a couple extra uses out of our stress-based ability, especially since we are a stress build. However, for those who have seen other Daggerheart videos or have been following along with the Daggerheart updates, you'll notice that there is now a second ability on the Furbolg, and that's actually the same for all ancestries. They all have two abilities tied to them. That's because in 1.4, there has now been a mechanical implementation for mixed ancestries. If you wanted to play a mixed ancestry of say, an elf dwarf or a fairy dracona, you can. If you were to do a mixed ancestry, you can then just pick any two abilities from any two ancestries and mix and match them. So for example, we could go down and pick natural calm from being a furbolg and then pick any other ability that we want, which we're definitely gonna do. We're gonna go down to Orc and pick their sturdy ability. The Orc sturdy ability says that when we use armor, we can roll a number of D6 equal to the armor slots that we would mark, and for every result of six, we don't mark an armor slot. The exact same thing as natural calm, just for armor. And that's again really awesome for this build because it's gonna help us save some resources in the long run. Just looking at the mixed ancestry option, I will say that narratively, I think it's a really interesting idea, and it makes sense in terms of what Daggerheart is trying to present itself, but I do think it also opens the door for a lot of for a lot of min-maxing or power gaming, whatever you want to call it, right at character creation. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'll leave up to you. But I do think it's an interesting option that just may end up taking away from being a pure ancestry. For example, the Furbog ancestry on its own is still pretty cool. Getting both natural calm and charge, the charge ability that they have allows us to sort of do a cleave attack whenever we dash, would be really neat and would actually work pretty well with our build. It's just the fact that we can get that much more slightly min-maxed by picking any two ancestry abilities that kind of takes away from just being a pure Furbog. Again, love it or hate it, I'll leave that up to you. Okay, now that we've got our heritage out of the way, I'm gonna skip over our experiences and just go right to our level up. The way leveling up on Demiplane works is pretty nice. You just pick the level that your character goes to so we can jump right to three, and then we'll just go through filling out the prompts that we're going to get as we level up. And we can see exactly what we get at each level up. So at level two, we would create an extra experience. Again, I'm gonna skip that for right now. We can see that our severe damage thresholds increase by two automatically. Our proficiency now goes up automatically with each tier of play. And level two is the second tier or first tier if you count level one as like tier zero. We also have two level up options to pick and we get an extra domain card. So 
starting with our level up options, we're going to just immediately increase our traits. When we do so, we pick two traits to increase by one, which I will choose strength and agility because those are the two that we mainly want, though you could pick any two that you really felt needed an increase. Then with our second level up option, we're going to increase our minor threshold. When we look at the character sheet, and I actually talk more about stress as a full mechanic because I do want to save that explanation for then so we can have the visual example, I'll also talk about the thresholds because they did get slightly rebalanced in 1.4 as well. So the issues that we talked about with Daggerheart's thresholds versus armor and efficiency and all that sort of stuff do still exist. They're not quite as bad in 1.4 as they were in 1.3. For the domain deck card, there are a lot of interesting options, either final words, healing hands from the splendor domains, which are both more support type abilities, or there is bold presence, which is really good for role playing if you were in a more role play centric campaign. Whenever you make a presence roll, add your strength straight to the roll, so you can be really good at intimidation and such. Finally, there is Body Basher, and this is what we're going to pick just because mechanically it sounds the best for us and our theory crafting. It says that on a successful attack with a melee weapon, you always add your strength trait to the damage roll. Going up to level 3, we can see our severe thresholds increase again by plus 2, and we have two more level up options, and we get another domain card. To me, going through the level up system, it feels like each level has certain options that are just infinitely better than other options. Getting our traits and minor threshold up right away from levels 1 to 2 felt like the absolute right choice. Here, because we've done those two mechanically powerful options first, we then just go down the list of the next two most powerful mechanical options, which in our case is probably going to be adding an extra armor slot to get just one more use out of our armor, and then one extra stress slot in order to get one more use out of our stress-based abilities. Finally, on the flip side of that, there is the domain deck card to pick, which does highlight how I think Daggerheart can do things really well. Admittedly, this is specifically for our build since we are a stress-based build, and like I said, the Stress Seraph gets access to a lot of stress-based abilities and level 3 highlights that perfectly. Every single ability we get at level 3 interacts with stress in some way. I'll quickly run through and summarize them, but there is one that we're definitely going to probably want to pick over the others. However, there's no real wrong choice. The choice I'm picking is just for the theory crafting potential, but really any ability could work. Starting at the bottom with Second Wind, Second Wind is a once per short rest ability that allows us to clear three stress or one hit point when we make a successful strike against an enemy. On a success with hope though, we can also clear three stress or one hit point from an ally who is within close range of us. This is an awesome ability that can see lots of use since it's once per short rest. Plus we can clear a vast amount of stress or one hit point if we really needed to, completely for free as long as we make a successful strike. And if we succeed with hope, we get a kicker. We don't even have to spend a hope or anything like that. This card is well above that cost curve for spending hope that I had sort of talked about with our other domain deck cards. We don't need to spend hope and we still get to heal or clear stress from not just ourselves, but potentially our allies as well. It is an overall great card, but not the one we're gonna go with. Lean on me is another card that is actually pretty good it's just not as good as something like Second Wind was. Lean On Me says once per long rest, so already it's worse than Second Wind just because it is long rest instead of short rest. When a character fails an action that they were attempting, if we console or inspire them, both of us clear two stress. The second half of the ability is actually what makes Lean On Me shine. This is not a combat oriented ability. It can be used both inside of combat if you want or outside of combat. The only prerequisite is that another character has to fail an action, and then we do a little bit of narrative flavor in consoling or inspiring our ally the way Daggerheart is meant to be played, and both of us gain the ability of clearing to stress. There's no range band limit, there's no spending hope or anything like that, so we're still above that sort of cost curve or ratio for spending hope. I'm not going to really map it out because there are so many abilities like this that don't actually heal hit points or clear stress, they just do one or the other. Just seeing this ability and comparing it to Second Wind, the card is worse than Second Wind, I think that's fair to say. However, it's still a really good card, especially if you were going in for more of a narrative-driven campaign, 
like Daggerheart is designed for. Critical Inspiration, on the other hand, is a combat-oriented ability that says whenever you or an ally close to you rolls a critical success on an attack roll, whoever rolled that critical success can immediately clear a hit point or an additional stress. This is really awesome. Critical hits are more common in Daggerheart than they are in D&D 5e, and if you can think of how awesome it would be to have been a champion fighter in D&D 5e and to have your improved critical affect not only you, but allies within 30 feet of you as well, you can see how great this ability is. Honestly, it's a really good contender for the card that we pick too, because it does exactly what we want and it synergizes with us. We took the I am your shield domain card, which allows us to take hits for allies within very close range. So we already want to be nearby our allies in order to tank damage for them. With this card, not only can we tank damage, but we also buff their critical hits, and that will allow us to provide a supportive benefit to our party members, as well as ourselves. And because we can clear some stress, it works with our stress-based build. But ironically, it's still not the one we're going with just for this theorycraft build, though I do think it's an amazing card in its own right. The card we're going with is Conviction. Conviction does the best of both worlds for Daggerheart, where it gives us a combat ability and a narrative ability. The narrative ability is that whenever we attempt to use our own candor to de-escalate a violent situation, or get someone to follow our lead, we just have advantage, passively. That's really cool. In combat, though, it emboldens us in moments of duress. When all of our stress is marked, our attacks are made with plus one proficiency. So we'll see how this actually works in our character sheet summary, but basically knowing that stress is like a stamina bar, which we don't necessarily want to have it get filled out and completely marked, but inevitably it probably will, having this in our back pocket in order to up our damage output could be potentially quite great for mopping up combat nice and quickly in order to not suffer the penalties of having all of our stressed marked provides. All right, so now looking at our character sheet, it's time to talk about what this character is meant to do as well as stress and what it actually does. So like I've talked about in other videos, stress is like a stamina bar. Anytime we use an ability that requires you to mark a stress, we just mark one. We have seven to play with, so we can be pretty liberal with how we use our stress. The thing is though, sometimes there may be narrative elements or narrative points that will require us to mark stress. Our GM may say that if we fail a roll, we could succeed instead if we mark a stress to do so. For example, if we're climbing up a cliff face, but we fail a strength roll trying to actually successfully make it to the top, and instead of falling to potentially our doom, or taking damage or anything like that, our GM says, you're near the top, so if you choose to mark a stress, you'll succeed. This presents it as an interesting mechanic because not only is it like a video game-esque stamina bar that we use for our abilities, it is also a potential narrative stamina bar that could get marked that way as well. So it's always nice to have a few stress available just in case of some dire consequences. Also, if we ever actually mark all of our stress, so for us that's seven out of seven, then there are some mechanical impacts. Number one, once your stress is full, you can't use any more stress abilities. So if we have seven out of seven stress marked, we can no longer use I am your shield, in order to take hits for our allies. Number two, if we have seven out of seven stress marked and we were to ever suffer stress damage again, so that could be through a narrative moment, or it could be because some enemies deal stress damage. In our playtest of 1.4, we went up against gelatinous cubes, and gelatinous cubes, if they absorb you, don't deal regular damage to you, they deal stress damage, and that can really rack up quite quickly. If your stress is fully marked and you suffer stress again, you actually start to suffer health. No way to reduce it, no way to prevent it. That can be quite dangerous. The last negative impact that being full on stress has is the fact that any enemy is gonna have advantage on attack rolls against us. So not only do they roll their d20 and get their modifier if they have one, they're also gonna roll an extra d6 because advantage and disadvantage is back to being an extra d6 roll in 1.4. And all of those negatives are why I chose Conviction as our level 3 ability. Conviction, because it allows us to increase our proficiency when all of our stress is marked, means that we're not just getting penalties when we have our stress marked. There actually is a little bit of a bonus, so it kind of offsets the penalties. 
it's probably a good assumption that we are going to end up marking all of our stress. So hopefully it just happens at the second half of combat or a little later, where having that extra proficiency allows us to increase our damage from 2d10 to 3d10. And then we can just go around swinging our axe and just clear out the enemies as quickly as possible before they actually get a chance to attack us. So now that we've seen what stress can do and why we picked conviction, let's look at what the rest of this character can really do. Well, with I am your shield, we can mark a stress to take an attack for an ally that's within very close range of us. When we do, we'll automatically reduce the damage by three, and then we can spend an armor slot as well. We have eight armor slots, and every time we spend one of those armor slots, we're also going to roll a d6 from sturdy. So let's do a little example right now. Let's say we're we're within very close range of an ally of ours, and they get hit. We decide to spend one stress, which means we would then roll a d6 thanks to natural calm. On a six, we don't even mark this stress. On a five or lower, we will, so we'll say we do just for the sake of argument. If that ally took, say, 12 damage, we know that we can automatically reduce it by our strength trait, which is three, so that would be down to nine damage. That's still in our major threshold because our major threshold starts at eight and goes up to 20. But because it's nine damage, we could spend one armor slot and reduce the damage down to zero. The other benefit is because we have sturdy, we roll a d6, and again on a six, we don't actually mark this armor slot. We'll assume that we rolled a five, so we do have to mark the armor slot, but we still took no damage. That's a really cool way to actually tank attacks for your party members and we can completely nullify those attacks pretty reliably because we have a high armor score. Now we've seen what this character can do and we've seen and talked about how stress works and I suppose a couple other things to mention are that even though we would be adding up a lot of the stress we have things like mending touch to be able to heal our allies so technically based on its wording it could probably heal us as well and allow us to clear our stress though it is meant to be more for an ally that you're helping. And we also have Sparing Touch, which allows us to clear two stress from any creature as an action, and that could definitely be used for us. So we have lots of different ways to get some longevity out of our stress mechanics, and that's really awesome. Other than that, though, let me know what you thought about the character build, or what you think of the system and how it's going so far in point four. If there's anything you'd like to see the designers change or add to how you think it's presenting itself. Thank you so much for joining me on the journey, and I hope to see you in the next one.